Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to this week's unit on rhythm. So to start off with, our objectives for this week are to understand visual rhythm, to describe how shapes and repetition can conjure feelings of rhythm in an image, describe how design elements are arranged to achieve alternating rhythm within an image, and to identify examples of where inherent rhythm is found. So to start off with, uh, a definition of rhythm is an element of design based on the repetition of recurrent motifs. So you think about it, anything that we create that has a recurring mo motif or something that is repeated will have a rhythm to it. Um, this, is, this occurs in nature, this occurs in the artworks that you draw. Um, anytime you frame a camera, you find things that look similar um, and they create a rhythm. Progressive rhythm, uh, repetition of a shape that changes in a regular pattern. Okay, so here we have a, a rhythm that, that is changing regularly. Here we have a more naturally occurring example with fence posts, and they create this uh, kind of a, a double rhythm. Um, here we have a rhythm created by the circles coming towards us, and that repetition is really, really emphasizing um, one one element coming towards us and one going from left to right. Motion in comic books is often uh, achieved by using repetition and using this rhythm of motion. Okay, legato. This is a term that comes from music. I'm sure some of you have seen it before. Um, meaning a connecting and flowing rhythm. Um, if you're using an instrument, it would be something where you do not tongue in between, so there is no space in between the noises. Um, so you know, a nice, calm uh, uh, wave or, or the feeling of a still pool, you know, architecture that we just feel like it it kind of slowly moves us through, you know, but it's, it's repeating over and over again. Um, here we see it in Van Gogh's Starry Night, heavily relies on this. You know, we have the, not only the repetition of the different elements within the piece, so we have, you know, the, the swirls in the sky, we have the stars that show up in the sky, um, we have the cypress that goes up, but also his brush strokes are just kind of repeated over and over again. And we get this rhythm out of his brush strokes. Um, this cover for an iron and wine album. Um, again, we can just feel that repetition happening in, uh, in the grass. It gives us this, this feeling of a, of an intense rhythm. Um, and the, and the green, the greens really, uh, give it this, this calm. So we have, we have this, combination of that uh, cool color and the cool rhythm, you know. Here we have uh, a rhythm that's created by the arches that recedes into the background. Okay, so here we have two separate terms, one, one being staccato, which means uh, a rhythm, a rhythm that that is kind of disjointed. We do we do hear a lot of space in between, uh, and then spiccato is similar. So it's kind of a bouncy alternating rhythm. Um, so the bouncy alternating rhythm, uh, something could be, I would think, both staccato and, but I'm not positive about that. So here we have uh, an off heart piece, which kind of makes us bounce all over the place. As Yeah. 
responsible uh, with them in those areas. That's why people study them. Kinesthetic um, empathy. Uh, so kinesthetic empathy is a term that refers to um, those moments when something is built for one sense, but you can feel it in a different sense. So like, I don't know if any of you work in kitchens, you know, like you smell something and then you can taste it. Or, you know, if you, if you can like feel the sun sometimes, sometimes it like makes you smell things a particular way or it makes you feel like warm and warm, but like, you know, different senses operate at the same time. Um, so like, you don't just feel the sun's rays, you feel like something else happening at the same time, or you hear, sometimes you hear that like weird, intense, high-pitched sound when the sun's shining, that was really weird. Um, so artists that really tap into this kind of feeling, um, Mark Rothko, uh, this is from his chapel in Houston, Texas, which dude's paintings are like kind of massive color, color field paintings and people just talk about how like they stand in front of them and then just end up sobbing sometimes. They're just like so emotional for some reason. Um, but anyway, there's an entire chapel of his work in Houston. So if you ever feel like going and being completely overwhelmed and feel super sad in front of some really incredible paintings, um, this, this is the joint to go to, the, the, the Mark Rothko Chapel in Houston. I love Mark Rothko. Um, his paintings are amazing, but I also just find the idea of going to a chapel that's specifically going to make you feel ridiculously sad very difficult to wrap my head around. Um, this is Anselm Kiefer, um, and he was a Holocaust survivor, and like literally all of his pieces are just like so intensely overwrought with emotion. Like you just, I went to a show with his work in New York, and it was just. You just like had a lump in your throat the entire time you were looking at stuff. You just like could feel ten tons of bricks like weighing on you. Like it's 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 really compelling work, but like this is a lot of feeling. So for one thing, like this painting is probably like thirty feet wide. You know, they had one in Portland for a while, and it was it was on the one wall um, in the Portland Museum of Art before you go up the stairs. Um, to the very top floor, so it's like that huge wall. It just covered the whole thing. Um, incredible work, but again, just super moody, super dark. Um, you can feel it. Okay, polyrhythmic. <clears throat> so polyrhythmic is defined by uh, complex patterns employing more than one rhythm or beat. So most of the pieces that you see, honestly, that incorporate rhythm and are polyrhythmic. Um, it's almost difficult to make something with less than one rhythm. Um, here's a piece by the futurist Umberto Boccioni. Uh, it's called The City Rising. If you look at it really closely, you can see two, two horses um, riding against their master. <clears throat> I don't know the name of this piece, but uh, you can see the straight up and down pattern operating against the patterns that are, that are operating from left to right. This piece was by Angela Warren, who went to grad school with me. Um, this was a piece that she did in the Maine College of Art, uh, Artists at Work um, window. So she collected a bunch of books that were all red and yellow spines um, and oranges. And then she put this pattern over the front um, that she cut out of blue. And the two patterns kind of the two uh, rhythms kind of worked against one another. Um, so the analogous colors versus this like complementary color or split complementary color um, that came out in front and we were kind of forced to, to negotiate the two rhythms um, operating against one another. It was pretty incredible. Um, here you have the rhythm, something going down the stairs. You have the rhythm going left to right. Um, so it's all created out of, uh, out of the, the pieces to show you uh, what frame to pick. I don't know what you actually call those. 
their joints maybe, but uh, yeah, interesting piece nonetheless. This is a Paul Clay piece, which uh, if you recall from the line unit was the fellow that said that a line was just a dot out for a walk. Um, anyway, his work is tremendously um, governed by by rhythm and sound. He was constantly trying to create pieces that sort of translated sound or or really got at the feeling of music. Um, so, suprematism is a, was a Russian art movement of the early 20th century that emphasized non-objective form. Um, this is going to become the most important style um, for us in this unit as your assignment will be based upon suprematist uh, artworks. While music has the advantage of the duration of time, painting's unique strength is that it can that it can in an instant present the spectator with the entire content of the work, which music is unable to do. Um, so here we have uh, Malevich, who is one of the two premier suprematists. Uh, his pieces are almost entirely uh, geometric uh, pieces. And it's really just all about the compositions and the rhythms and the color. This is Vasily Kandinsky, who, if you recall, during our discussion on abstraction, was doing those funky paintings of the mountains in Russia. Well, after a little bit, he moved on to suprematist art and was just concerned with form, 100% form. The dog is mad, sorry. So here's a couple more pieces of him. These ones, these drawings were really fascinating. Uh, he's trying to make these gesture drawings, which were communicating what the ballet dancers were doing um, as simply as he possibly could. Just beautiful stuff. All right, vibrating colors. So vibrating colors, um, create a flickering effect. We can do this by um, using a value relationship or a strong hue contrast. So if it's, if it's, if something's really, um, really light versus something really dark next to each other, that'll kind of flicker for you. Or if you put like complementary colors against each other, um, that will work. So I have two artists that I'm using really as examples of this. Um, and in kind of keeping with, you know, musical and rhythm pieces. So this is Stuart Davis. Um, and Stuart Davis uh, did a lot of work in like jazz clubs um, and spent a lot of his time in Paris and a lot of his time in New York City. And you kind of try to mishmash the two locales. So like in this painting, you see some references to French speaking and some references to English speaking. And you also just see like kind of this like sort of mesh of color schemes almost too. Um, anyway, his, his city scenes and his, his jazz scenes, so much rhythm to him and you can really see those color, colors kind of, kind of working against one another. Um, this is Brian Barniclow, he is an illustrator and muralist working around San Francisco. Um, and you can kind of see some definite similarities between Stuart Davis's style and his style, but they're both kind of using these really flat colors that sort of vibrate against one another. <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk about these couple of videos. Um, briefly, I'll be adding links for you later on so you can check things out. So this is um, Peter and the Wolf. And <clears throat> the cool thing about this one is that Prokofiev goes through the different instruments and how their sound kind of communicates a different character in each of the, in each of the different parts. Um, so it's really kind of incredible, like, you know, the clarinet sounds like the cat. 
and the bassoon sounds like this old walking man. Um, so interesting stuff. Um, and really kind of getting at that, that sort of kinesthetic empathy again. Um, <clears throat> this is a, is a, um, graffiti gallery piece done by Lucy McLaughlin. Um, and it's, you know, kind of, before you go playing it, it's got like kind of an aggressive sound to it. Um, so I wouldn't turn it up all the way. Um, but the imagery is really funky and fun. Um, just like kind of a completely different, uh, method to go about arriving at this sort of rhythm piece. Um, these three links I'll end up providing for you. Um, two of them are to uh, David Ellis projects um, that are really pretty incredible at once. Uh, an interview with Thomas Kentbell. All right. <clears throat> so your project this week is to visually interpret rhythm in a variety of media, colors, and marks. So what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and find a piece of music. I would suggest a piece of music that does not have uh, any vocal track, because that will complicate matters. Um, but you can use one with a vocal track if you so please. But what I'd like you to do is to, in your sketchbooks, create kind of a library of sound. Um, so, you know, try to pick out maybe like the bass. And for every sound that they make, just kind of try to recreate that, translate that into whatever media you have at home. So you can use, you can use digital media, you can use pencils, uh, color pencils, paint, uh, oil, um, whatever, paper cutout, um, throw your little brother or sister at a canvas all covered in paint, like whatever, whatever arrives at these sounds. So why don't you make a library of these sounds? And then I want you to make a non-objective piece that kind of speaks like that Vasily Kandinsky or Malevich sort of uh, really like non-objective shape-based solution to an artwork. And I want you to translate whatever that piece of music is that, you, that you're trying to communicate with onto some sort of substrate. I don't care if it's on two pieces of Bristol board or if you like walk out into your backyard now that you're stuck at home and you go be on a car door off of some old DeSoto that your grandfather left behind. Like whatever. Um, in fact, if you have an old DeSoto and you wanna do that, that's super cool. I would love to see it. Um, so surprise me. Um, <clears throat> In the written portion, portion, I'd like you to tell me in 150 to 300 words about an instance where a color made you feel something and what that feeling was like. Like Some of you maybe will not be able to answer this one, but I'd just like you to try. You can tell me, like, yo, like you're nuts. I've never felt anything because of a color. Um, and here's just a couple of examples of pieces that people have done in the past. Well, one example that appears in in class did, and then several that Paul Clay did, rather. Uh, so this one, uh, Mark Patino did, it's a, it is a visual representation of Lucy in the sky with diamonds. And here is a Paul Clay piece of an opera, and another Paul Clay piece of a different opera, and another Paul Clay piece. So, you see, very different ways of going about the rhythms in the piece. And here are just some tips. Um, so once again, instrumentals or songs with minimal lyrics work best. If you choose a song with lyrics, do not illustrate the lyrics of the songs. I don't want to see any of the lyrics written out. I don't want to see guitars or anything like that. So no depiction of images of guitars, drums, etc. Non-representational marks only, please. Um, so nothing abstract either. Uh, one of the most common visual representations of music we have is that of the graphic equalizer, or bars that bounce up and down. Don't get locked into thinking that is the only way to depict music. Um, when depicting the song over time, 
think beyond a simple left to right movement. Um, if you're stuck, view some more images of works by non-objective painters like Vasily Kandinsky, Stuart Davis, Jackson Pollock, Juan Moreau, or Paul Clay. I didn't give you any Juan Moreau to look at in this lecture, but dude was on his shit. So enjoy, guys. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I look forward to the things that you post this week. Thank you. Bye-bye.